Well, we can pack this one up, folks. The Cleveland Indians are a mere two outs away from their first championship in almost 50 years. Up to bat next is Charles Johnson. Jose Mesa tosses a first pitch ball before dotting up the corner on pitch number two. Johnson fouls back pitch number three. Cleveland is now four strikes away. Arguably no player has waited more for this title than the team's ace, their longest tenured member, starting pitcher Charles Nagy. Born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Charles Nagy had Hungarian ancestors. The name Nagy means great or big in Hungarian, so he is quite literally destined to be a good MLB pitcher. He grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida before moving back to Connecticut. Like most high school stars, Nagy excelled in not only one sport, baseball, but also football and basketball. He committed to Cornell to play football, but actually wanting a career in sports, he transferred to UConn to play baseball. He would only play for two seasons, first as a reliever and then mostly as a starter his second year, winning Big East Pitcher of the Year both times. In 1987, he played summer college baseball with the Harwich Mariners. In the summer of 1988, he did something different. He tried out for Team USA Baseball and made the team prior to the 1988 Summer Olympics. A few teammates would include some future major leaguers like Tino Martinez, Robin Ventura, and Jim Abbott, who will all be important in a few moments. The team went to the Olympics and won gold against Japan in the final. Where is he in this pile of bodies? No, I don't know, right there? It was a demonstration sport, so it doesn't count for Team USA's total, but Nagy can forever put gold medalists on his career accolades. In the 1988 MLB Draft, seven pitchers were taken ahead of Nagy, but he would become the first UConn player ever to be taken in the first round of the June Draft. The next player was some center fielder I've never heard of all the way in 2011. Nagy went to Cleveland and received a $126,000 signing bonus equivalent to about $315,000 in today's money. That was enough to sign him and he quickly breezed through the minors, being called up in June of 1990, making his Major League debut on the 29th. Now I think it's important to know the vibes around the Cleveland baseball organization at this point in time. They hadn't been to the playoffs since 1954 and the biggest contribution they made to baseball was the movie Major League, released in 1989. Jim Abbott, remember him, was the star of the day, pitching a complete game with two runs allowed. Nagy allowed four runs through four and a third innings, not exactly ideal. His next start was much better, but he was still given the loss. Then came the blow-up start that all new pitchers have at some point. He made his first career relief appearance on September 8th, and it would be his last one for a long while. Of course, you might remember the next time he came out of the bullpen. But finally, he gets his first career win 10 days later against the Brewers. His penultimate and final starts both had a very eerily similar final stat line. And that was it for 1990, not a great year for Nagy, but he had a great spring training and a really good 1991 season with an exceptional July, earning himself but a single Rookie of the Year vote. Here's a fun fact, not only was Charles Nagy the opening day starter for Cleveland in 1992, he was the first ever visiting pitcher in Camden Yards. He pitched for eight innings, allowing just two runs with one walk and six hits. But he did take the loss because Cleveland didn't want to score any runs. Coincidentally, around the same time, Jacob deGrom picked up a baseball for the first time. He rebounded by posting a 1.63 ERA in April, and then a 2.72 ERA in May and June. He was really good at the All-Star break, so naturally he was selected. He made his appearance in the 7th inning with a 10-1 lead over the NL. Oh hi Craig Biggio! Nagy's first offering is a strike. The next pitch is fouled off Biggio's face. And then he gets sat down with a 3-pitch strikeout. Darren Dalton grounds out on the first pitch. Gary Sheffield is next, and he somehow doesn't swing at this pitch. He did swing at this one, though. He fouls off the next one, takes an upstairs ball, fouls one back directly at you, the viewer, and then he grounds one to Travis Fryman, who ends the inning. So, a good performance by Nagy. Now, obviously, with a pitcher spot who up first in the eighth inning, a pinch hitter would probably come in to replace him. Except, uh, one problem. Tom Kelly had the goal of getting every single position player off his bench to be used at some point in the game. Well, he did that, and he ran out by the time Nagy came up. Now, now at this point in baseball history, the DH was not a guarantee in the All-Star game like it is now. If the game was hosted by an AL club, there was a DH. If the game was hosted by an NL club, there was no DH. This All-Star game happened to be hosted by the San Diego Padres, a National League club. So Charles Nagy has to go out there and embarrass himself on national television. Position players into the ball game. No position players left on the bench. Nagy might have a hit. He does. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only time a pitcher has gotten a hit in the All-Star Game in the designated hitter era. 
It snapped an AL pitcher hitless streak that dated back to 1963 when Ken McBride slapped an RBI single into left. He was still the last AL pitcher to get a hit until Shohei Otani got one off old friend Clayton Kershaw. Of course, Nagy didn't immediately get picked off, so clearly he's the real two-way player. Maybe Nagy can teach him a thing or two. Hey look, it's Robin Ventura. He singled Nagy over to second. Oh, and by the way, Nagy is wearing a Texas Rangers batting helmet. Evidently, Cleveland's other all-stars didn't have any to spare. Ruben was on the 1989 Rangers Sierra grounds into a fielder's choice, with Nagy now on third. Fryman has a single, and Charles Nagy has somehow scored a run in the All-Star game. Incredible. Jeff Montgomery replaced Nags in the bottom of the eighth. Hilariously, the NL ran into the same problem in the ninth inning when Norm Charlton had to bat for himself. Hall of Famer versus a guy with a career .082 batting average to that point. Naturally, the AL won 13-6, and Ken Griffey Jr. won the game's MVP. For the rest of 1992, Nagy underperformed his first half, but he still finished with a solid season, including a complete game one hitter on August 8th in Baltimore, with the only hit coming in the 7th. Just like his Rookie of the Year finish, he received but a single Cy Young vote. Good for him. 1993 was not going great, but it was cut short by a shoulder injury on May 15th. Nagy needed surgery, which cut his season short. But he did make it back for one final start in the last game of the season, which happened to be the final game at the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium. He faced the ALCS-bound White Sox and gave up one run in the first on a Frank Thomas double. Then Joey Cora grounded into a custom-made double play that scored an unearned run. Hey Robin, long time no see. He gets an RBI single. And that was it for Charles Nagy's 1993. Cut short by injury, we can excuse his poor performance. But this start will become more important many, many years from now. 1994 was a good all-around season for Cleveland, and it was the precursor to some of the success later on. A bunch of players had their first good season. The construction of a new stadium that began in 1992 was finished. They named it Jacobs Field and almost got no hit in their first game there. But don't worry, they still won on a walk-off. Nagy had a season comparable to his 1992 campaign, but as with the hundred or so other storylines in 1994, it got cut short by the strike. Finishing second in the division is major progress for Cleveland, considering they haven't done that since 1959. But 1995 was where everything really came together. The 1995 Cleveland Indians were a really good team. Going by winning percentage since integration, they were the second best team ever. Jim Tomei and Manny Ramirez both continued the success from 1994. Kenny Lofton made his second straight All-Star game. Albert Bell was great, hitting 50 home runs and 50 doubles despite a particularly infamous incident in July. Paul Sorrento hit a career high in home runs. Omar Vizquel did that thing he always does. You know, not great hitting, defensive highlights that make your jaw hit the floor. Fan favorite Carlos Baergo was doing great. Sandy Alomar Jr. was limited by injuries, so veteran journeyman Tony Pena received most of the games at catcher. Hall of Famer Eddie Murray was near the end of his career, but he showed he still had some gas left in the tank by hitting 323 as the primary DH. Oh, no way, Pools hit number 700. So that's the lineup. Nagy himself said the pitching staff was overlooked thanks to all the stellar hitters. And he's not wrong. Nagy himself had a decent year, but aside from him, the rotation was fronted by El Presidente Dennis Martinez, who had one of the best seasons of his career at age 41. The team brought in veteran righty Oral Hershiser to replace veteran righty Jack Morris. Chad OJ was good. Speaking of Chad OJ, you probably know about OJ Simpson's infamous police chase that interrupted the 1994 NBA Finals. Well, Cleveland happened to be watching as that was going down, and when Manny Ramirez heard about it, he asked Chad if he was okay because the police were looking for him. That's right, Manny heard OJ and thought it was OJ. The bullpen was elite. Julian Tavares, Eric Plunk, Jim Poole, and Paul Ossenmacher all had great seasons. They were just there to set the stage for Jose Mesa, who had an insane year. 56 saves, 64 innings, 8 earned runs allowed, 1.13 ERA, 1 blown save all year, a 2nd place finish in Cy Young voting, and a 4th place finish in AL MVP voting. By the way, Nagy received but another lone Cy Young vote. This team was built to dominate. They won the AL Central by 30 games and had the best record in the majors by 10 games. You couldn't even imagine a couple of years ago that we'd be here today, Nagy said, having watched the team grow around him. They would see a first round ALDS matchup against the Boston Red Sox. Nagy was slated to start game three, so he would have to sit and watch as in game one, the Red Sox tied it up in the eighth. And then they took the lead in the 11th. Don't worry, Albert Bell has an answer for that. Then the former Red Sox Tony Pena sends the fans home happy with the game one win. 
Game 2 was something unexpected. Oral Hershiser dominating in the postseason. That's a joke. Seven in the third innings with a measly three hits allowed. Take notes, Clayton! Eric Hansen wasn't doing too bad either, at least until a two-run double by Vizquel and an Eddie Murray two-run shot in the eighth. Now it's Nagy's turn. His opponent was Tim Wakefield, who is a knuckleballer. And what do knuckleballers do? Leave hangers in the zone that can get absolutely blasted. Thankfully, this pitch didn't go to a good power hitter. Just kidding, it's Jim Tomei, the 8th best home run hitter of all time. You can kiss that one goodbye, Tim. In the meantime, Nagy just dominated, allowing four hits and one run on a sack fly. Cleveland is headed to the ALCS. They had to wait a few days for the Mariners to clean up their business against the Yankees. The Mariners are riding momentum so high, it's a wonder they didn't win game one 50 to nothing. But Oral Hershiser continues his remarkable streak of not receiving a loss in the playoffs with a game two win. At this rate, he's never going to lose a postseason game. Now it's Nagy's turn. You remember how at the beginning of the 1994 season, Cleveland almost got no hit but ended up walking it off? Well, the pitcher that almost no hit them was Randy Johnson. The 1995 AL Cy Young winner was about as dominant as anyone ever. And friends, Charles Nagy is about to keep pace with him. Back home in Cleveland, the Tribe Faithful are prepared for their first home ALCS game ever. Nagy started two games at home against the M's in the regular season. He pitched 16 innings and allowed four runs, collecting the win both times. Johnson started one game and tossed a complete game with only two earned runs. But it's Friday the 13th in October. What could possibly go wrong? Nagy starts the game out by getting the speedy Vince Coleman to ground out, but he hits the next batter, Joey Cora. Now he has to pitch to Ken Griffey Jr., arguably the best hitter in baseball. He gets the count to 0-2, but Jr. gets a single up the middle. Now he has to pitch to Edgar Martinez, arguably the best hitter in baseball, but he is slumping, he's 0-6 so far in this series. Now make that 0-7 on the pop out to second. The 2-2 to Tino Martinez is in the dirt. 3-2, two outs, the runners go, and Nagy gets out of it with no damage done. Now for Johnson to go to work. Kenny Lofton hits a tapper that he almost beats out because he's Kenny Lofton. Then Vizquel hits a flyout, and finally, Johnson's first strikeout. Yeah, I'm surprised it took this long too. Now here's Jay Buhner, one of Nagy's greatest foes. Among all hitters with as many plate appearances as Buhner, only Junior has a higher OPS. I mean, here he's in the same company with Frank Thomas and Paul Molitor, and here he gets them. He to Buhner, and here's a drive to deep left, and he has rung Nagy up again. Mike Blowers, he of the home run prediction, comes up and Espinosa almost holds on to the ball for too long. Soho lines one to the scale, and come on, man, that's too easy. Can we get an instant replay of that? Yeah, that's that good stuff. And for out number three, Nagy picks up his first K. Johnson gets a pair of ground outs to lead off the bottom of the second before another K to end it. Vince Coleman grounded to first, that's an easy out. Cora grounds it to second, that's an easy out. With Ken Griffey in the stands, Ken Griffey singles to right. Junior takes off for second, but Alomar's pitch skips past by Erga and Vizquel almost makes an insane play. Edgar grounds it to third, that's an easy out, aw, dag nabbit. This time, Alomar's throws on the money as Edgar Martinez is gunned down. Just like last inning, Johnson gets back-to-back -back ground outs followed by a swinging strikeout. So far, he's faced the minimum his first time through the order. Dino Martinez rips one to right, but Manny Ramirez is able to snag it. On a 3-0 count, Buhner takes a hack at it, but he fouls it away. Then he grounds it to Vizquel. Flowers singles on the first pitch, but then Soho grounds out on the first pitch. Finally, Johnson's perfecto is broken up as Kenny Lofton hits a triple to left field. Great. Omar hits a sack fly, and it's 2-1. Baerga gets another single, but Bell hits a fielder's choice, and Eddie Murray hits a weak pop fly to Cora. Now it's Nagy's turn to dominate. Nagy K's Dan Wilson, and then gets Coleman to ground it to himself, and then Cora to ground out to Vizquel. Manny Ramirez leads off with a strikeout. Then Blowers makes a great play to retire Perry. Johnson loses Alomar on five pitches and gives up a single to Espinosa. But to end the inning, Johnson K's Lofton. The heart of the order is up. Nagy gets Griffey looking, then he gets Edgar looking, then he gets Tino swinging. Excellent inning, Charles. The scale bounces a ball that should have been off Johnson's glove, but he's almost seven feet tall, so that's a ground out. Flowers then makes a good play to get Baerga, and Bell flies out. With his brother in the stands, Buhner's not Nagy's, Nagy battles back from 2-0 to strike Buhner out, looking. After a deep flyout from Blyer, Soho manages a single before Dan Wilson hits one right to Ramirez. 
A couple of Hall of Famers going at it, and Johnson wins this battle. Manny hits this tapper that is easily scooped up for the out. Now in baseball, sometimes the hitter walks, and sometimes the pitcher walks the hitter. This is the latter, no offense to Herbert Perry. Matter of fact, Perry, go home. Thank you. Nagy is still dealing here in the eighth. Coleman gambles with a two-strike bunt, but Alomar makes the throw in time to first. Cora first pitch grounds out to second, and then Junior ends Nagy's performance with a ground out straight to the first baseman. But this duel has two combatants. Junior corrals this one, then this one is uh-oh, it's a windy day, isn't it? I wonder what's causing all this bad luck. Then Kenny Lofton somehow hits this ball through the defense and we have a tie ball game. Lofton is fast, he takes second. The all-time leader in sack bunts squares up to bunt and he pops it directly up to Wilson. Just great. Johnson and Wilson conference on how to get Bayerga out, and whatever they said must have worked, and now Johnson's day is done. So who did better? Well, both starters were pretty much the same. Eight innings, two runs, one unearned. Then it gets uncanny when they both had six strikeouts. Not weird for Nagy since he only had seven Ks per nine. But it was weird for Johnson since he had the highest K per 9 of all time to that point. Author's note, some guy in the 1800s had a higher K per 9 in 51 innings, but who cares? Nagy allowed 5 hits, Johnson allowed 4 hits, but did walk 2. In the end, they both ended up facing 30 batters. The game would go into extras as Jay Buhner would make up for his error by belting a 3-run home run to win the game. Hoping not to go down 3-1 in Game 4, Cleveland's offense exploded for a 7-run performance. Oh, and Ken Hill was lights out for 7 innings. Now time for the ever-important Game 5. Trailing 2-1 in the 6th with a runner on 2nd, Jim Tomei was about to show the world Cleveland wasn't a pretender. The 2 0 2-3 is your final score. In Game 6, Cleveland only led 1-0 in the 8th thanks to some more Johnson dominance. Tony Pena led off with a double, then Lofton bunted for a base hit, then he stole second. Kenny Lofton is fast, do you want an example? Okay, here you go. It gets away, heading home is Amaro, to third is Lofton, they have no play, and now here comes Lofton all the way, and he scores! Johnson was fading, he allowed a home run to Bayerga moments later, and just like that, Cleveland is headed to the World Series. Their opponent would be the Atlanta Braves, who have already made two World Series this decade. The big three of Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz is as unstoppable as any trio of pitchers has ever been. Nagy is slated to start Game 3, meaning he's going to have to face one of the big three no matter what. Game 1, the Professor vs. the Bulldog. You're never gonna believe this, Oral Hershiser lost a postseason game. I mean, it only took him 10 starts, but that Greg Maddox guy... Complete Game 2 hit, 2 unearned run, 0 walk, 95 pitch, masterclass. Game 2, Glavin vs. Martinez. This game wasn't defined by its pitchers, but by Braves catcher Javi Lopez. With the game tied 2-2 in the 6th, Lopez launched a 2-run home run off Martinez to take the lead. Then in the 8th, Manny Ramirez singled with 1 out. With a tying run on first, Jim Tomei was at the plate. And Lopez figured, eh, might as well, and he picked Manny off at first base. The final score was 4-3. The Braves are up 2-0 in the World Series, but they haven't seen Charles Nagy yet. Game 3, Smoltz vs. Nagy. The fate of the magical 1995 Indian season has been saddled onto Nagy's shoulders. It's been 10 days since his last outing. Interesting thing about Nagy, 1-9, through nine, his highest ERA comes in the first inning. So if we can get past that, we're likely golden. And for the first time in decades, the World Series is headed to Cleveland. Leading off is Marquise Grissom, who lines out to center. A bouncer to Bayerga is fielded and thrown over. Then comes Chipper Jones, who doubles into left center. Fred McGriff, who tore up Cleveland this series, drove in Jones to take the early lead. Then Moneyball legend David Justice pops one, and Albert Bell almost takes Omar Vizquel's head off. Now for Smoltz to go to work. Lofton gets on with a single that Vizquel would have gotten. Hey, speaking of Vizquel, he initially shows bunt, but then he drills one all the way into the corner as Lofton easily scores. Oh, and here comes Omar right into third. Bayerga, add to this, please. Thank you. Bell and Murray ground out, but the damage has already been done. Liner up the middle, hey, Omar, we were just talking about you. Javi Baez pops out, and Mark Lemke grounds out. Good inning, Nagy. Smoltz then freezes Tomei, but he loses Manny, who makes up for getting picked off last game. Then Sorrento is also frozen, and Alomar goes down whiffing. Good inning, Smoltz. Oh boy, another quick inning. A K, but backwards. A K, but forwards. And a fly ball to end the inning. Top of the order for Cleveland, and Lofton is already on second. Omar squares around a bunt, and that is an absolute beauty right there. Bayerga makes it 3-1, and then Bell makes it 4-1. Good inning so far, guys. Eddie Murray strikes out, but Tomei walks to leave the bases with just one out. And that was it for John Smoltz. This remains his only career World Series start in which he didn't go at least six innings, and the only one where he allowed more than three earned runs. Brad Klontz comes into the game and gets the double play, but Cleveland still has all the momentum. 
With the opposing starter gone, Nagy does not allow a Brave past second until the sixth inning when Fred McGriff took him deep. He's sent back out for the seventh, and then he allows a home run on the first pitch of the inning. Now, Mike Hargrove isn't a terrible manager. I mean, I've seen worse cases. But I got a question not pulling Nagy here. I mean, it's a one-run game in the seventh. Even worse, why send him out for the eighth? Hargrove then watched as Nagy allowed a double and a single to cut the lead back to one. And that was it for Nagy on the day. The bullpen charged him with his fifth run. Then the Braves regained the lead. Then Cleveland tied it up in the eighth, and then they walked it off in the eleventh. Charles Nagy has just helped save the Indians from falling in an inescapable 3-0 hole. Unfortunately, the Braves pitching staff was too much for Cleveland. Two runs allowed in Game 4. Oral Hershiser got them back on track in Game 5. Nagy was scheduled to start Game 7, but the World Series ended in Game 6. Cleveland's magical dream season was over without a championship. So what's this? Well, the city of Cleveland was so proud of winning the pennant that it tossed a parade for the team. Remember, it had been almost 50 years since their last title. They were desperate, and 1996 would increase that desperation. Remember Charles Nagy? Yeah, I haven't mentioned him in like 20 seconds, so I figured it was a good time to remind you that he exists. And Nihu, Nagy was given a shiny new contract, and he rewarded the organization by having arguably his best season to date. This along with being selected to the All-Star Game for the second time in his career. Since Cleveland won the AL in 1995, Mike Hargrove was the manager and he went with Nagy as his American League starter. And you'll never guess who NL manager Bobby Cox sent out to be the National League starter. That's right, John Smoltz. In a rematch of Game 3 of the World Series, Nagy underwhelmed. On the first pitch of the game, Lance Johnson slaps one right in front of Albert Bell. He scampers to second for a double. Here's Hall of Famer Barry Larkin in the middle of his best season. Nagy gets him to ground out. Now it's another Barry, Bonds, in the middle of, well, I was going to say one of his best seasons of his career, but, you know. He grounds out and Johnson comes across to score. Hey, Fred McGriff, welcome back, and get out. That's a K for Nagy. Here's something I bet you didn't think you'd see. A website ad in 1996. Wait, does it still work? Oh my gosh, it does. Hello, Marlins legend Mike Piazza, and goodbye to that baseball. Man, that's a deep one. Bobichette's dad is up. He grounds out. Chipper Jones is making his first of eight All-Star games and getting his first All-Star game hit. Oh, hi, Craig Biggio. He fouls off a million offerings before the late Wade Boggs thinks about a double play before deciding better of it. Pinch hitting for John Smoltz is Henry Rodriguez. No, the other one. The other one. He singles to right and it's 3 0 NL. Lance Johnson grounds out and that's that on Charles Nagy in the 1996 All Star game. He received the loss thanks to the AL not scoring. And Mike Piazza won MVP of the game thanks to that blast. Remember Eddie Murray? Even at his old age of 38, he was still capable of leading the team in batting average and having a couple of huge hits, including the walk off in the World Series. But in 1996, things were different. He wasn't hitting well and he was almost exclusively a DH. Put those two things together and you don't get a good player. So they flipped him back to his longtime team in the Baltimore Orioles. Carlos Baerga was one of the most popular players on the team, which made his brutal start to the season feel even worse. He was flipped to the Mets and his career never really recovered. Nagy finished with an excellent year, earning more than one Cy Young vote for the first time in his career. Once again, Cleveland finished with the most wins in baseball, although by a much smaller margin than last year. But this wouldn't be an October to remember. Facing old friend Eddie Murray in Baltimore, Game 1 was in Camden Yards. So not only was Nagy the first visiting pitcher at Camden Yards, he was also the first visiting postseason pitcher. Nagy got the Game 1 nod and immediately gave up a deep home run to Brady Anderson. Not great. Nagy was unable to bounce back, allowing another home run and a couple more runs. And guess what? More runs. Hey baby, we aren't done yet. Bobby Binet hits a nuke. Remember him for later, by the way. In Game 2, Cleveland battled hard, but the Orioles again pulled away. And after taking Game 3 at home, Nagy was on the mound for Game 4, facing elimination. He gave up back-to-back -back home runs in the second, but that's all Baltimore would get out of him as he polished off his sixth inning of work with his twelfth strikeout of the day. But leading by one with two strikes and two outs, Jose Mesa allowed a game-tying single. Not a great moment for Mesa. It gets worse, though, as Mike Hargrove leaves him in long enough to face Robbie Alomar, brother of Sandy, again. He beats Mesa again. So that's three straight disappointing ends to a season. What is one to do? Oh, I know, how about we kick the second and third best hitters off the team? Bruh. Albert Bell at least makes sense. The guy had a screw loose, but Kenny Lofton? Why? Well, you know how when a player's in the last year of their contract, the team usually tries to flip them for something? Well, that's what happened here. Now, was it a mistake? I don't know, what do I look like, a doctor? Dr. Pepper, that is! That's right, they got the soda man David Justice himself. And also Marquis Grissom. So now what? 
Nagy was doing fine, not as good as the prior season, but his ERA of 4.28 was better than the average pitcher because look at the year and look at the league. Cleveland was around 500 deep into August, but they got hot and finished 86 and 75. Not good, not even really playoff contention worthy, but it was good enough to win the garbage AL Central. They had a date with the defending champion New York Yankees. They split the first two games right in time for Nagy's Game 3 start. Again opposing Nagy for the third straight postseason game is David Wells, and for the third straight time Wells' team gets the best of Nagy's team. Game 4, Cleveland is trailing 2-1 in the bottom of the 8th with Mariano Rivera on the mound. Seems like an impossible scenario to come back from, right? <laughs> Omar Vizquel walked it off in the 9th and Cleveland was hosting Game 5. A three-run third inning off playoff Pettit had them in good position, but the Yankees battled back to make it 4-3. With a runner on first, Jim Tomei makes a phenomenal defensive play, something that runner couldn't dream of. And then to tie up the loose end, Cleveland turns two to end the seventh. Then with the runners on the corners and two out, Jose Mesa snagged it himself to end the eighth. He stayed out there for the ninth, and the Cleveland Indians had defeated the New York Yankees. Up next is a rematch with Baltimore. And for the second straight series against the O's, Brady Anderson led off with a home run. Then Robbie Alomar, brother of Sandy, hit a two-run home run. Final score, three to nothing. In game two, Nagy allowed a two-run homer to Cal Ripken and a two-run single to Mike Bordick to make it 4-2 Baltimore. That was the end of his day, but Marquise Grissom launched a three-run homer in the eighth to give Cleveland the win. In Game 3, Mike Messina was insanely dominant, striking out an LCS record 15 batters in only 7 innings of work. That record is very impressive and would likely stand for a very long time. Well, at least until, let's see here, the next day when Eric Gregg decided he wanted to be a part of history. Somehow, Cleveland ended up winning in 12 thanks to one of the stupidest walk-offs you'll ever see. Game 4 was a slugfest with Baltimore tying the game up in the ninth inning, but Cleveland walked it off for the second straight game. Down 3-1, the Orioles won Game 5. With a chance to win the series, Nagy got back on the hill and finally had an outing on the same level of his 1995 ALCS. Just like that game, this game went into extras, but unlike that game, Cleveland pulled out a close win to clinch the series. For the second time in his career, Charles Nagy will pitch in the World Series. Game 3 would be his. Cleveland would split the first two games before heading back home. Al Leiter would take the mound for Florida, and both starters would do pretty terrible. The game was a slugfest, with Leiter allowing 7 runs in his 4 and 2 thirds of work, but Nagy wasn't doing much better, allowing 5 earned runs in his 6 innings. The score was knotted at 7 heading into the 9th inning. Now, if I told you Cleveland scored 4 runs in the bottom of the 9th, you would rightly assume that they won the game. Except I neglected to mention that the Marlins scored, are you ready for this? seven runs in the ninth inning. That's only ever happened four other times in the ninth inning of a postseason game. So that is an insane anomaly, and it just so happened to happen in the game started by ya boy. Interesting thing about the 97 World Series, it went like this. Marlins win, Cleveland wins. Marlins win, Cleveland wins. Marlins win, Cleveland wins. See a bit of a pattern there? Guess whose turn in the rotation it was for Game 7. You'd be correct if you guessed Nagy. However, Mike Hargrove was a bit antsy of Nagy, who had thus far in the postseason put up a 5.16 ERA with 14 runs and 22 in a third innings. He also had the option of starting rookie Jared Wright, who had done pretty good in his start against the Marlins. So, who would you choose, Nagy or Wright? Now be warned, as there's only one right answer. Get it? Because Hargrove chose right. But don't worry, Nagy is available out of the pen in case of some emergency. A rookie pitcher hasn't won Game 7 of the World Series since Babe Adams in 1909. This Cleveland ball club has a history that dates back to when the man named Cleveland was president. The Marlins haven't been around long enough to experience anyone other than Bill. This is the biggest game in the last 30 years of Cleveland sports. Here. We. Go. The biggest game in baseball starts with Vizquel slipping out of the batter's box. Then comes a lined out and a grounder on the first pitch. Okay, right, let's see what you're made of. First pitch ground out, good start, but I could do without the double. And the walk isn't helping things. Fernandez gets one, but Vizquel can't make the just kidding, that's illegal. Although I don't doubt that Vizquel could have made that. Ever seen a bat go farther than the ball? Well, now you have. Matt Williams fouls off a couple offerings, but he eventually strikes out. On another full count, Alomar pops up. An easy pop-up to Fernandez, then an easy grounder to Fernandez. And then Charles Johnson is frozen by this excellent pitch. Tomei walks, Grissom singles, and Wright sacrifices them both over. Second and third, one out. What do you think happens? Well, first the scale pops out, then Tony Fernandez hits a two RBI single. I can see it now! Tony Fernandez, Game 7 hero. Ramirez walks, but Soto Man can't capitalize, and it's 2 to nothing. 
Greg Council flies out, but then curiously, Al Leiter walks. Devon White takes eight pitches just to strike out. Renteria walks, but Sheffield is retired. Williams is struck out. Alomar picks up a single, Tomei flies out, and Grissom strikes out to end the inning. Wright induces a ground out and then a pair of Ks, one backward and one normal. Then Wright himself strikes out. Scale gets a bloop single, then he takes off and snags second. Fernandez goes down swinging, and with first base open, Florida opts not to pitch to Manny Ramirez. And there goes Vizquel again, but this called third strike ends the inning. Is there no justice in the world? Well, actually, he's right there, but you know what I meant. Wright makes the play himself for out number one. Craig Council goes down looking, and somehow Al Leiter pulls out another walk, but Devon White is unable to get this ball past the warning track. Leiter loses Williams, and after a foul pop-up, he gets the double play he really needed. Renteria lines out, and by this point, Charles Nagy is warming up, but why bother? Wright is doing fine after striking out Sheffield for the second out. He almost hits Dalton, but ends up, oh no, that's going to the wall. Error? Yep, error. Don't worry, Alou can't manage much. A rookie has gone six one-hit innings in Game 7 of the World Series. We've got a new pitcher for Florida, Dennis Cook. He gives up a big crack, but it dies at the track. Out comes Jared Wright. It seems as though Mike Hargrove will stick with him and let him go out for the seventh. Of course he strikes out. What American League pitcher could ever manage a hit? And the scale goes down swinging. Now in the seventh, it really is amazing how long Jared Wright has gone without making any mistakes. The seventh inning stretch and Bobby Bonilla launches one to deep right. Bonilla sends one out of here. That blast single-handedly added 14% to Florida's chances to win the game. Nagy and Paul Ossenmacher are both warming up as Wright gets a strikeout. But then he can't find the zone, walking Council on four pitches. Now what? With the pitcher's spot on deck, Cliff Floyd is in the on-deck circle, but then Hargrove pulls Wright. What a performance by the rookie. So Ossenmacher is in, and instead of Cliff Floyd pinch hitting, it's Kurt Abbott. Ossenmacher gets Abbott to fly out to Manny, and he gets White swinging. That's the seventh inning over. Antonio Alfonseca comes in here in the top of the eighth. Tony Fernandez bats lefty now and grounds out. Manny Ramirez goes down looking, and David Justice grounds out. Michael Jackson, no not that one, takes over in the eighth. Edgar Renteria slips and falls, so he's unable to even try and beat this throw out. Not exactly the way you want your final World Series plate appearance to go. Sheffield whiffs, and then Jackson is out. Brian Anderson, no not that one, takes over in the eighth. And he ends the inning on a ground out from pinch hitter Jeff Conine. Matt Williams walks. Sandy Alomar almost grounds him to a double play, but Renteria can't get the ball out of his glove, so the Marlins have to settle for just one. And that's it for Alfonseca, as Felix Heredia is put in. Jim Tomei immediately cracks a single, and just like that, it's first and third with a one out. Conine and Heredia are out. Rob Nen and Jim Eisenrich are in. Marquise Grissom grounds one that could have been a double play, but Renteria decides to come home to save the run from scoring. But don't worry, I'm sure Cleveland didn't need that extra insurance run. Brian Giles pinch hits for Brian Anderson, and he flies out. The Cleveland Indians are three outs away from a World Series victory. Did I mention that it's Mike Hargrove's 48th birthday? A World Series ring would be a pretty good present, and that's exactly what Jose Mesa is trying to do. Moises Alou is first up. He's 0 for 3 tonight, and he breaks his bad getting the leadoff single. Mesa then battles with Bobby Mania for 7 pitches before striking him out. Up to bat next is Charles Johnson. Jose Mesa tosses a first pitch ball before dotting up the corner on pitch number 2. Johnson fouls back pitch number 3. Cleveland is now 4 strikes away. This is really happening, and then it isn't. A line drive to right that drops for a hit. Alou is on his way to third. Ramirez has no play. This isn't happening. This can't be happening. Nagy is up as the fireman in case this gets worse. Things did get worse. A deep drive to right. Ramirez on the run. Makes the catch. Tagging is Alou. Game 7 of the World Series is tied. Just like that, it's a tie game. Mesa retires Jim Eisenrich on an easy play for Tony Fernandez. We are heading to the 10th inning. Vizquel strikes out, Tony Fernandez singles, and then Ramirez and Justice both strike out. Mesa is still out there. After getting Devon White out, he gives up back-to-back -back singles. John Canned Jello pinch hits and Mesa retires him. Hargrove has seen enough. For the second time in his major league career, out of the bullpen comes Charles Nagy. Now here's where I question Mike Hargrove. Oral Hershiser was also in the pen warming up, so why not bring him in? He has far more relief experience in his career and even a postseason save in Game 4 of the 1988 NLCS. But in fairness, Moises Alou has a hit off Hershiser and he's never faced Nagy. In any case, the fate of this series is now resting on Nagy's right arm. His first delivery is outside. Then Nagy gets Alou to pop it up to Manny and Wright. 
Jay Powell walks Matt Williams before Sandy Alomar's bunt fails to do anything productive. And to make matters even worse, Jim Tomei grounds into an inning-ending double play. Nagy's still here, and he gets a big whiff on his first pitch to Benilla, then a called strike. But Bobby just manages to push this past the shortstop Fernandez. Greg Zahn, the backup catcher, squares to bunt, but it rolls foul. Then he bunts the next one back, and then, still bunting with two strikes, he pops one right to Nagy for the easy out. Unfortunately, Tony Fernandez can't get behind Benilla in time to judge him at first. Council fouls one back. Then he takes the called strike. Then he fouls it right off his foot. We've officially reached October 27th. Council fouls another one away. Then a high ball. And then the best possible outcome. Nagy gets Council to ground into an almost custom-made double play. Side. Fernandez has it go through him. Bonilla will try for third. Eisenreich is put on first. The team conferences on what to do. Nagy jams White and Fernandez guns down Bonilla at home. Nagy buckles Renteria on his first pitch. But it doesn't matter, you know what's happening next. The 0-1 pitch. Of all the modern era World Series, four have ended with a Game 7 walk-off. Ralph Terry, Alejandro Peña, Charles Nagy, and Mariano Rivera are the unlucky souls who gave up the walk-off. Of the four players, one finished their career without a World Series ring. That player is Charles Nagy. At its most basic, baseball is a pitcher versus a batter. But when you give up a walk-off, the pitcher is all by himself on the mound. There's nobody else with him. Unlike after 95, there would be no parade. Not with heartbreak this big. Nagy's career certainly wasn't over yet, but it certainly was in the downward part. Hey, so you remember a few minutes ago when Kenny Lofton was traded for David Justice and Marquise Grissom? Well, Grissom departed in free agency, and Justice wasn't really a great option to play center. So, needing someone in that position, guess who they signed? Kenny Lofton. Incredible. Off the top of my head, I can only really think of one other example of something like this happening. Also, a subplot in the offseason after the World Series, the Montreal Expos were doing what is known as a Marlins, where they were getting rid of a bunch of their key players. They elected to put 1997 Cy Young winner and soon-to-be free agent Pedro Martinez on the block. The asking price for Cleveland was two young pitching prospects you probably recognize. Bartolo Colon and Jared Wright. See, this is where the timeline splits. Because sure, there's the timeline where Pedro is traded to Cleveland and gets hurt a bunch while Wright and Cologne become dominant forces for years to come, but the timeline we got ended in Pedro being traded to the Red Sox. Spoilers, but Cologne wouldn't exactly become the force Pedro was. Jarrett Wright was fine, but he wasn't healthy after his first couple of years, and he bounced around a few teams before calling it quits after the 2007 season. Pedro would, well, you know. Cleveland brought in Robbie Alomar, Sandy's brother, and they again won the AL Central. Nagy had a bad 1998, but he started the 98 postseason strong with eight one-run innings in Boston. After clinching the series in Game 4, Cleveland had a date with the 114-win New York Yankees. Going straight up by wins, this was the best team in American League history. But Nagy was not phased. He went six and two-thirds innings with only one run allowed in Game 2 to help tie the series after Cleveland pulled away in extras. In Game 6, trailing 3-2 in the series, Nagy got back on the hill. And he only lasted three innings, giving up six runs, three earned as the Yankees polished off their second World Series title in three years. So most people consider the 98 Yankees to be one of the best teams of all time. In the regular season, they scored 965 runs. The 1999 Cleveland Indians scored 1,009 runs. Nagy had his third All-Star season with stats that, frankly, wouldn't impress anyone. Oddly enough, he wasn't even the worst All-Star pitcher that season, thanks, steroid era. And now I'd like to highlight an outing he had in May against the Blue Jays. Oh hey, David Wells, long time no see. Nagy took the mound, and here's the lineup card. Alex Ramirez batting 7th as the right fielder, and Manny Ramirez batting 4th as the DH. Well, as it turns out, Manny saw this lineup card and ran out to right field. Now, he was supposed to be the DH, but since he ran out to right field, Cleveland had to forfeit the position for the rest of the game. And thus, Nagy, not Alex Ramirez, is batting in the 7th spot. Now, I can't personally think of any pitchers I would want batting instead of a DH. Maybe- No, wait, just got one. He played for the Angels for a while. Zach Greinke. So, Nagy has to trot out there like this is the National League or something. But hey, give Nagy some credit, he battles for 7 pitches before he strikes out. He comes up again in the 4th, this time with the runner on base. Now, just because he's not batting ninth doesn't mean he isn't bunting. Nagy- oh, come on. Yeah, he's mad at himself for that one. 
Oh, by the way, Nagy started the game where Wade Boggs got his 3,000th hit. He gave up numbers 2,998 and number 2,999. But it was reliever Chris Haney who gave up the home run that he hit for number 3,000. Time for the playoffs. After a come from behind win in game one, it's Nagy bump day for game two. And he continues his utter decimation of the Red Sox in the postseason. Cleveland was up two to nothing, but they were absolutely demolished in games three and four. So naturally, Nagy was sent out to get the win in game five. So far in his career, Nagy has gone seven, eight, and seven innings in his three starts against Boston in the playoffs, allowing just three earned runs the whole way. But here he gives up two runs in the first on a Nomar Garcia para homer, and then he gave up five in the third, capped by a Troy O'Leary grand slam. And after a leadoff double in the fourth, Nagy was out. That run scored, but somehow, mostly thanks to Jim Tomei, Cleveland was still in the game. It was tied eight to eight, then appeared Pedro Martinez. Thought to be injured in game one, he was unable to start in games four and five. But evidently, he was healthy and against arguably the best offense ever. A hobbled Pedro Martinez straight up no hit them for the final six innings of the game. And that's how it ended. Not just the series, not just the season, but Charles Nagy's postseason career. And to a lesser extent, his career in Cleveland. Remember that lone start he made after coming back from injury in 1993? Well, from that date, October 3rd, 1993, to May 16th, 2000, Charles Nagy did not miss a single turn in the rotation. 192 consecutive turns came up, and until his trip to the DL in May of 2000, he missed none of them. An absolute workhorse in those years of 94 to 99, he was near the top of the innings pitched, wins, and games started leaders. Up there was some of the best pitchers of the 1990s. And I feel like when remembering this almost dynasty that Cleveland had, it's important to remember Nagy, who was there from the beginning. In 1999, Nagy started 32 games. In his last three years in Cleveland, Nagy started 31 games. Of course, he made plenty of bullpen appearances, but his time in Cleveland was clearly over thanks to countless elbow injuries. He joined Jarrett Wright in San Diego and made five quick forgettable appearances with the Padres in 2003 before retiring to join the Indians coaching staff as a special assistant to Mark Shapiro. Basically, he was one of these guys in Moneyball. Although technically not because Moneyball took place before he retired. He wound up becoming the Angels AAA pitching coach, but after a few seasons, he left the team to spend time with his family. In 2007, he was inducted into the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame, and he returned as the team's AAA pitching coach in 2009. One season of coaching and one season of not coaching later, the Arizona Diamondbacks gave him the chance to be the team's major league pitching coach. All right, look, so here's the 2010 Diamondbacks ERA, right? Terrible, not that great, one of the worst in the majors, right? Well, here's the 2011 Diamondbacks team ERA. Above average, and you can thank Nagy for that. He clearly made a big impact on Arizona's pitchers who took everything he did to heart, including giving up series-ending walk-offs. Despite that drastic improvement in ERA and continued level of performance, Arizona chose to part ways with Nagy after the 2013 season, partly because he didn't instruct his pitchers to hit more batters? Wait, what? Okay, yep, yep, that makes lots of sense. The Diamondbacks pitched the seventh most bean balls in 2013, by the way. He was again rehired by Cleveland for a minor league pitching job. What is that, like the fourth time that's happened? Then he joined up with the Diamondbacks again as the pitching coach in 2016, but after the worst ERA in the majors, he was let go. In 2017, he would take a job as the Major League Pitching Coach with Los Angeles. But before he retired for good after the 2018 season, he would teach a new prodigy. A player so extraordinarily gifted, he rewrote the rulebook. A player so talented, he was comparable to only one man. A player so charming, he's now the face of baseball. A player I've already mentioned several times. You probably know who I'm talking about. Coming soon, what happens when a franchise has two of the greatest players in baseball and can't manage a playoff berth? Find out next time in The Trout 3, how the best player in baseball has three career playoff games.